I started doing events for Hero Robot and Sly Fox and Punch Buggy. Like, yeah. I mean, I live, you know, second in Gerard, like right in the neighborhood. And it yeah. feels like every single event that goes on, you're running it. <laughs> I, you know, I am very proud that I get contacted by a lot of people and um, I get a chance to work with a lot of amazing breweries and cideries in the city. What you're doing is working because like it's now it's like the area is known for having great street fest and it's yep. like you're running all of them. Like yeah. you're in charge of like, all the great things that are happening. podcast i'm your host richie tevlin joined again by evan blum and tonight we have meredith rebar owner of homebrewed events thanks for having me basically a doer of everything in the city <laughs> i won't get into it but i mean i think the limits you to homebrewed events is kind of very narrow I, I think you know having an event coordinator we have a lot of different people in here but having an event coordinator is something that a lot of people don't think about and you, you seem to have your hand in just about every large scale thing that happens in the city or small scale thing that's like <laughs> different brewery operated, event coordinated. Um, and then, I mean, we can get into your classes too, but I think there's a lot of connections with you and Brewdat also that I want to talk about. It? But yeah, if you just want to introduce kind of Homebrewed Events and kind of tell us what it's all about. Yeah, so Homebrewed Events is my company. Um, started in 2013, uh, originally doing in home brewing classes. So um, have your friends over, brew a beer, and then you get to keep the beer. Um, moved away from that to more beer pairing classes, uh, went through Cicerone training, so nice. did all of the sensory stuff, um, uh, got to certified Cicerone, which is second level, yeah. um, and doing, you know, chocolate and beer, cheese and beer, dinners, beer dinners, um, all sorts of stuff, and then adding on big scale events, um, both street festivals as well as, well, as, well as beer well, so big jump up from yeah. like <laughs> <chocolate> beer <laughs> parents to like 20,000, 40,000 people events. Yeah. You know, I switched over. So the company was founded in 2013, yeah. but I switched over to doing it full time in 2016. Nice. Um, and I had to figure out how to make more money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I have a huge background in event planning. Um, so it was very easy to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, and there's a lot of breweries that can't afford or don't have enough work for uh, an events person. Um, so I reached out to all my contacts and, um, you know, kind of got connected with different people to do um, beer festivals. Yeah, essentially, like, I mean, you are an expert on it, so like, <laughs> you're kind of a consultant. So, like, people, I mean, people, a lot of these people are like home brewers or just like they're people that own, brew, like, not just home brewers, like, people just, start a brewery, they don't know how to throw a large scale event. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, same thing with Evan is trying to help people out with, and Brudat's trying to help people out with social media and kind of marketing stuff. It's like, you know, because you have to wear so many hats as, you know, a small business owner or a craft yep. brewery owner, it's like you're now taking one of those hats and you wear it permanently and kind of make sure that it's the best event possible. Yeah, it's, it's fun. And I, you know, I've done pretty much everything in the beer industry, so I have a lot of contacts. We could talk about that in a little yeah, bit, yeah. but... Um, I know, I know about beer. <laughs> I know how beer is made. I know, you know, the movers and shakers. Um, and I also know how to market the events and work with the city and all of the million things that go into yeah. making the event happen. Um, budgets and spreadsheets and all the less fun things. Yeah. All the logistics <laughs> that make it, make it fun. Yep. <laughs> cool. So I guess, I mean, you have a history of, you said running events, you graduated Penn State with, yep. with, what, a marketing degree? Yes, I went for business, focusing on marketing, cool. and then also communications. Actually, funny enough, focusing on film. Uh, oh, really? I've done nothing with it, but <laughs> it was uh, it was fun. <laughs> I wanted to do documentaries, but... That's what my uh, girlfriend does, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it was, really, it was really cool, because I was able to start my first business while I was in college. Um, in high school, I started booking my friends' bands because I was the organized one and yeah. not the yeah. musician. Um, so I'd book the fire hall and make nice. the flyers, sell the tickets, um, and it just became like I loved it. I love music. That's that was my first passion before beer. <laughs> we won't tell anybody. <laughs> it's still it's still a passion. Um, but I was able to, I reached out to a place called The Brewery, funny enough, in State College. That's where I turned 21. Yeah. <laughs> I had an ashtray shot. Drank oh. a 
as a straw amount of, will say a cigarette. <laughs> amount of bad decisions that have happened there yes. in the best way possible. Um, I, that's so amazing because I, while I worked with the brewery, my first legal drink was at the first. Nice. Irish bar. Um, <laughs> And they had beer, cocktails, and whatever. It was fun. It was great. Did you wear a hat? One of the green hats? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get thrown out at midnight? You yeah. Checked all the boxes. <laughs> yep. Did all the things. Um, but I was able to start booking shows um, on Tuesdays, and then eventually as I started getting better and I got bigger bands, worked up to the weekends. Nice. Um, which was really fun because if you've ever been to State College, very it's a college town. It's literally just a college town yeah um <laughs> so trying to compete against like cover bands with original music was hard sell definitely um so it was fun i, I got to really yeah, I figure to out to how for the 10, <laughs> oh god <laughs> so much um but it, it you know it was fun and i got to book some really big bands while i was there um you know and it was just a really great experience nice so that was all in college and i guess you were that was an actual business you weren't just doing it yeah for them i was an actual business um i set up the llc cool. um you know did basically you know all the background work that i needed to yeah. do for that um and i continued doing it was called cherry darling productions yeah um and I continued doing that in Harrisburg when I moved out, out to Harrisburg. Nice. Um, I actually started working with Appalachian Brewing Company, um, doing events in the Abbey Bar. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so it was essentially kind of the same thing? Like it was just kind of events and like you were kind of set up their events program there? Yeah. So I did. I worked with a company that was also booking there called Greenbelt Events. Okay. Um, and I helped with their booking. Um, and what did they have? Events. They just had musical events or was it just like normal bar events? Did they have like... Normal, like music. Okay. Yeah, it cool. was a it was a live music venue. Cool. Um, uh, second floor of Appalachian Brewing Company in Harrisburg. Nice. Um, and it was. Uh, is that still there? It is still there, but they don't really do a lot of music stuff okay. after the pandemic. Yeah. Unfortunately. Definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, it's still there. It's still beautiful. Um, and it was really like really full of amazing Belgian beers. So it was like kind of really fun to like I got to you drink their beers but then also they imported a bunch of really it, was that kind of your first dive into actual beer like craft um, beer no I I fell in love with beer in college okay um you know um <laughs> but then, not you know lion's head was great it was yeah, a dollar yeah. at Sharky's whatever um but I found a bar that reminded me a lot of monks okay um and it just was such a great experience I was like why does the beer look like this? Why does it taste like that? Yeah. Um, why is it this color? Why, you know, what does Belgian beer mean? What does German beer mean? You know, what what is all this? Yeah. <laughs> um, so they had a beer passport, and I just started working my way through um, all of their... They're about their... beer passports, really, <laughs> yep. so... You're so, about this right um, now. you know, self-study, as they say. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then I was like, ooh, I want to start homebrewing. So I started homebrewing at the end of college um i was like yeah fermentation style is really fun let's do it uh so my friend brian taught me how to homebrew and we brewed together and had like little homebrew parties nice. and it was just really fun how was it was it any good <laughs> yeah actually i would say other than i got really ambitious <laughs> it, like my fourth batch in and i made a mexican chocolate like spiced stout nice so i added like fresh jalapeno yeah um chocolate powder and like you know so when i bottled it and like you know carbonated it was really basically metallic <laughs> i was like oof um because if you've ever had the fresh jalapeno you know that there's yeah. a lot of metallic flavor Definitely. in the seeds especially yeah um and that was all i tasted so i got really frustrated and i just put it in the closet and forgot about it for about a year yeah uh pulled it out i was like oh what's this uh, and it had settled, so it came out good. Nice. It just took time to. <laughs> oh, I think you're talking settle. about the, kid, the actual beer itself. Yeah. You it. Oh, you, nice. You were yeah. aging your home yeah. from yeah. the beginning. Whoops. <laughs> Sometimes happy <laughs> accidents. Nice. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. Um, but yeah, I I loved making beers, and I pretty much did one kit, and then uh, started doing my own stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. I was the worst home brewer of all time. Um, I won't go back. <laughs> I was really bad. Really? Yeah. I didn't have the patience. I, I mean, do it. I was just trying to like, I was making stuff up as I went, and it was like, it was not great. It's really hard to do because you're basically working in a not like 
sterile environment without like all the fancy equipment and we'll, yeah my parents have a water softener at their house so, like everything had like so much salt in it and i was like i don't know what's wrong i was like uh, the water was terrible for beer like you can't brew beer with water softener when did you start home brewing Richie? like the, it was in college but i only did like three or four of them I'm like this ain't working i need to <laughs> jump up to commercial level and see if i can actually do this or stop <laughs> Uh, so that was in college. So you graduate college, and then yep. you immediately start. I guess this was what after the Abbey Bar. So I moved to Harrisburg. I my first job out of college was working for the American Cancer Society. Yeah. Um, doing relay for life events and like large scale fundraisers. More events and stuff, though. Yeah. Okay. So it was you know a couple thousand people fun you know fundraiser for um and I had I was responsible for five different events. Nice. Um, but I was doing the Abbey Bar, um. In the evenings. Yeah. yeah. I always had multiple jobs because I wanted to Yeah, I mean, your resume learn. is like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, all right, when did yes. she start this? When did she stop that? I'm like, wait, she did all these things all at once. Yeah. <laughs> there, yeah. <laughs> and then it's I just like, like homebrew events during all of it. I was like, okay, yeah. I guess figure it out. <laughs> um, yeah, I always had full-time job, and then I would do Side stuff hustle. part-time to, yeah. like, learn. And I knew I wanted to get into the beer industry, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and where. Um and I, that's when I started working at Troves while I was in Harrisburg. Um, I helped them move from Harrisburg to Hershey uh, in their tasting room staff. So that was a cool experience to I'm see. I'm sure. I mean, that's one of the yeah. best tasting rooms <laughs> in the whole state. Yeah, it was, it was amazing to see it from scratch, mm-hmm. you know, from For an sure. empty room to what it is now. Um, and when I first started, you know, they were just setting up all the systems and um, moving as we, we were talking about water moving from Harrisburg to Hershey, it's a different water source. So working on the recipes and seeing how they did that. They say chocolate. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. (laughs) Everything is chocolate. Um, No, it was, it was just a really cool experience and they really focused on staff, sensory training and education. Uh, And that's where I learned about the Cicerone program. And I knew that that was the direction that I wanted to go. So So you you were just taking it at that point or were you leading those classes? Um, I was I was the certified beer server while I was at Troves, okay. and then when I was at Ariglio, that's when I did the certified system. And you jumped what right from Troves to Ariglio? Did you move, you moved in the city at that point? Yeah, so I actually took a job with the American Camp Society, um, doing um, legislative work, okay. uh, as well as fundraising and events. Uh, that brought me to Philadelphia in 2013, and no, 2012, uh, and then. I switched to a Reglio end of 2013, um, you know, basically about a year after I yeah. um, And I was with the Reglio for about two and a half years. Doing what there? Um, I did their marketing and social media and then wrote for the publications. Nice. Is so, that publication still going on? I've heard that that publication, but I don't know um, if I've seen it in a while. Yeah, so it was Draft Lines, yeah. uh, spelled the European way Draft Lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... Um, one was for the for the internal and one was external. Okay. Uh, draft lines was external um, communication. Okay. So consumers. Yeah. yeah. What was the internal? I can't remember. Um, but it was a publication <laughs> that we wrote for um, anybody who purchased the beer. Nice. So mm-hmm. we got a chance to work directly with the craft team. Um, got to interview uh, a bunch of really cool people. So like Sam from Dogka Shed. Um, Rudy cool. from Rodenbach, Back like when like they were like super hot and like yeah. everything was going on. So it was Rudy from Rodenbach is a character. I talked to him. Before. Yes, he's, he's a lot of fun. <laughs> it was so much fun, um, and we actually did a short um, like video series about beer cocktails as well. That's cool. So um, Dan Linham and I did that. He was the bartender, and then I was kind of the nice host. Um, bartender at where? Uh, he's bartended everywhere. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I he's doing Spirit Forward now, uh, which is like a, a cocktail catering company. Cool. So, um, but yeah, uh, we worked on beer recipe, beer cocktail recipes, which was really neat. Nice. <laughs> How do you manage your time? Like, <laughs> uh, well, so, not. I mean, I've always been an active, busy person. Yeah. And I like doing that, and I I'm always learning, and you know, even now, like. You I'm just doing... finished up your yoga training, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like you already have like three jobs and you did yoga training. So I, um, yeah, I'm always continuing education in some aspect and then working. Um, I, I love doing homebrew events and so I'm very yeah. happy to be doing it. Yeah. Um, but with homebrew events, there's busy times and slower times. Okay. Yeah. Um, spring, summer, very busy. Fall, also very busy. Um, winter, 
kind of slow. Um, so I want to do, and I am going to do yoga in between. Yeah. Um, and of course yoga and beer, cause that's going to work out really well. Of course. <laughs> um, do a little beer tasting after a yoga class. Um, and then also working with distilleries cause I have a lot of connections with, uh, local distillers as well. Uh, Manitani still works is going to be doing, uh, Sunday afternoon classes with me. Nice. Um, what at their Fishtown location? Fishtown. Nice, I like that place. Yep. Um, so yoga class and then into a uh, happy hour for them. Cool. Yeah. So it's going to be 1245 every Sunday, little, little yoga, little happy hour after. Perfect. <laughs> get your workout in and get a buzz yeah. on. <laughs> so what you went from, where did you go from a then? So, um, Origlio, I actually got laid off from Origlio. Uh, it was 2016 and it was when they had acquired, uh, Bella Vista. Okay. So our they were merging marketing departments. Yeah. So our whole department got let go while yeah. they were doing the the merger. Um, but I was very happy that like they treated everybody really well. We got severance, and I was like, nice. okay, well this is my chance to see, see if homebrew yeah. events works. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a little bit of a cushion. So you were already doing homebrew events at this point, but it was yeah. just mostly tastings and you know these little crap uh, homebrew stuff. Yeah, so it was... And the beer education stuff. Yeah, I was starting to do beer, more beer education. After 2015, I started doing Cicerone classes because uh, I was certified in Cicerone. So anybody who was going through that like process that wanted guidance, I, helped, yeah. I started doing that. Um, but yeah, 2016 was when I switched over to doing it full-time. Added a lot of events. Um, started doing the tastings more so than the brewing. Was, was there something where you're like, I... Like, I want to do this. Was there, like, one type of event that where you're like, I know I could kind of use this and, like, lean on this? For? For the homebrewed events. Like, you knew, you knew you wanted to do, like, larger events. Was it like you just jumped right into doing festivals and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I used all the contacts that I had, and, like, um, I started doing stuff for, um, well, I started brewing at St. Benjamin's. Uh, so I was a brewer at St. Benjamin's for two and a half years with Andrew, who is now the head brewer, one of the owners for Human Robot. Um, during that time, I did their events for them. We did a couple street festivals on North Fifth Street. Uh, I did my own events. I did a coffee and beer festival. Nice. Um, brain blank. What did I do in 2016? <laughs> um, it was a lot of, uh, you know, building and then I added a uh, Second Street Festival to my list of events in 2017. Was, was that was Second Street Festival already going on, or you? Yeah, Second Street Festival has been going on for about 20 years. Okay, um, that is a monster. That's like one of the 15 years. That's my favorite. Event yeah, <laughs> it's every single year. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah, that was that was the largest event that I've ever done. Um, it and was, it was 2017 to the pandemic. I mean, it was what 40,000 people? You said really? Yeah, so 30 That's to 40,000 people. Um, eight up to eight blocks, depending on you know the layout. Yeah, it's basically from Gerard down to Spring Garden. Uh, there's beer gardens, 150 vendors, like 50 food trucks. People um, play music all over the place. Yep, there's you know three stages, all all night. busker stage. <laughs> yeah. Um. So that was. And then yeah. uh, North Pole just turns into a rave. It's like yeah, they like, they do the what, DJ like bowling out and then just turns into like a club like. It, it's, it's they do nuts. DJ 10 outside. Yeah. Um, so I was their executive director until after 2020, uh, 2021, and moved to management by the bid, which is the business improvement district. Um, and they're kind of overseeing most of it right now. Nice. Um, going back, what was your process of like scaling up homebrewed events to then going to these like major festivals? Yeah. I mean, you know, so when I was with the American Cancer Society, I was right out of college and responsible for a couple thousand people. Yeah. Um, and like my fundraising goal was a half a million dollars. So like so I was already used had the experience to kind of doing that. that. I really credit a lot of the bigger scale event stuff to the American Camp Society. Yeah. Um, you know, they did a really good job of training you how to deal with it. I like, think if you like yeah. cherry pick <laughs> your resume, it's like everything seems kind of random, but everything literally works exactly in the everything has served a purpose yeah. for something else yeah, it's cool. <laughs> um and you know working towards you know being in the beer industry i knew that i wanted to eventually brew um i'm glad that i had a chance to brew with andrew yeah um it was a very small brewing team it was just andrew myself and josh so we all got to do everything we got to brew i got to come up with some of my own recipes which was amazing for yeah. a newer brewer 
um, you know, it was a wonderful. Amazing. And as much as St. Benjamin isn't around anymore, it's like human river has taken it over. So it's like, it's part of beer history. Exactly. Beer history that like, <laughs> you know, you were a part of kind of everything coming up at that time. It's, I, I think that Humor Robot has done such an amazing job with that brew house yeah. and that space. And now, you know, they have four other, you know, four locations. All over the place. Um, you know, they're doing just a, an amazing job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no you know, and Andrew, all Andrew wants to do is make loggers. Yeah. And they really just let him do what he does best, um, focusing on Czech loggers and German loggers. Uh, and then adding a couple IPAs here and there and other seasonal, um, you know, periodic yeah. releases. So you were at, you were brewing for St. Benjamin, and I guess you were still doing homebrew events on top of that? Yeah, so 2016 was slow. I think 2016, 2017, it was still slow. Yeah. So I was full-time for a little bit and then switched to part-time. Okay. Um, and then 2018 was when I left St. Ben's uh, to really focus on Second Street, focus on growth. Yeah. Um, 2018 and 2019 was two of my biggest years prior to the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was, um, you know, I had tons of events. <laughs> um, and then after the pandemic, I started doing events for Human Robot and Sly Fox and Punch like, Buggy. I mean, yeah. I live, you know, second in Gerard, like right in the neighborhood. And it yeah. feels like every single event that goes on, you're running it. <laughs> I, you know, I am very proud that I get contacted by a lot of people and um, I get a chance to work with a lot of amazing breweries well, and mean, cideries in the city. What you're doing is working because like it's now it's like I mean I've only lived here for six years but like the area is known for having great street fest and it's yep. like you're running all of them like yeah. you're in charge of <laughs> all the great things that are happening. Thank you. <laughs> um, no it's great and I, I am very proud of the partnerships that I have. So you you work with Human Robot with doing that Oktoberfest. Uh, did you do the log jamming also? Yep. So I helped them start the log jam and logger fest, which we actually did in 2020. Um, oh really? Yeah. Okay. It was outside. Yeah. It was in that window of time where you could do outside <laughs> yep. stuff under a certain number of people. Um, and then this is where your legislative experience yeah. goes. Yeah. <laughs> God. Um, and then uh, Oktoberfest as well, uh, again, outside. Um, so they have, this will be the fourth year for Log Jam. Log Jam is the best beer fest I've ever been to. I, I texted uh, Jake after. I was like, that didn't, I've been to a lot of beer fests and a lot of beer fests, like especially, um, we won't name names, but there we've been talking. There's some, there's some beer fests that aren't so great. And it's just kind of the same stuff over and over again. I it felt like we were at a party there. It was It's so fun. Yeah. And you know, I since I've been in the beer industry for so long and you know, when I was working at Troves or working at um St. Ben's, like I I attended a lot of beer festivals as a representative. Um the whole idea of beer fests have changed. In the past it was like it's a drinking fest. You can drink as much as you want. Mm -hmm. And there was and nothing like, besides just rows and rows yep. of corny kegs going out yep. and then just people drinking out of little six ounce glasses. It was, you know, it was almost very, <laughs> there were a ton of those events and there wasn't any necessary like theme or focus to it. It was just, it was just get drinking and go. Yeah. And I remember getting asked so many times, what's the highest alcohol content? What's the beer with the most hops? Yep. And I will say the last, I think since pandemic and even 2019 has started changing the dynamic of beer festivals. You know, the generic drinking fests aren't really popular anymore. And if you notice, a lot of them have not come back. I mean, it's the same way that breweries, yeah. I think, have, you know, your tap room has to be uh, like a well-run restaurant at this yep. point. It cannot be just like a four blank walls and you're just pouring beer there because you have a G license. Yep. It like it has to be a legitimately nice place to go to. And beer fests are the same thing. No one wants to go to these canned beer fests anymore. They want to go to these curated events with yep. unique things that are happening and that are run like perfectly smooth. Yeah, it's so like it's the, it focusing on, there has to be something more to it than that. Yeah. So Log Jammin is focused on loggers and Humor Robot does such a great job um at curating the list of of breweries and I, for dispute yeah, and they bring October in breweries Fest had what, yeah they brought in like an international setup yeah so um log jamming is a beer festival and yeah. then Oktoberfest is more of a traditional Oktoberfest. Yeah. although it's like half traditional half 
not at all because we had a German band and then we had um, uh, metal bands. <laughs> so yeah. it's just like half traditional, half not. Uh, but it's called USA versus the world. So U.S. brewers and then a whole tent of international beers um, and some of the best that you can find. Um, again, Hema Robot, very... Another crazy beer know. fest. I was standing there yeah. and Ken was just standing at the bottom just throwing up post sandwiches at people. And I turned my left and like Asher Roth is just like smoking weed next to me. Yep. I'm like, what is happening right now? Like, this is crazy. So fun. <laughs> um, you know, we, the first two years we were able to use Sunflower and we did a yodeling contest and Ken would throw cans of beer to people that would yodel. Um, we switched to tokens for this year because we were all on Germantown. Um, and we had a, we also had a wiener dog beauty contest. Nice. Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, wiener dog is very funny. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's finding, you know, again, they're both really well thought out, really curated. Um, they are brewery run, which I think also makes a big difference yeah. instead of like, these big companies Just a coming party in, person bringing yeah. In everybody, there's else. no. You need some heart and soul to yeah. the events 100%. for people to want to come out. Um, and then another event that I'm very proud of is the Sly Fox uh, Goat Races, Fox oh, Fest and I, Goat Races. Oh, those are great. Those are <laughs> so feel, entertaining to watch. Yes, yeah, I feel ashamed that I've never been to that before. It's like oh, the fact that like this I'm is the hosting year. this and it's like I've been involved <laughs> in Philly beer scene forever and I've never been to that. Like I'm totally ashamed. But that <laughs> this I know is how your cool year. It is. Yes. Um it's actually on Cinco de Mayo this year, so it's May fifth. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um so yeah, I, I started working with Sly Fox two years ago. This will be my third year. Um they moved from just an open event to ticketed uh because it got so crazy and you never knew how many people were gonna come. Um so they hel I helped them transition to a ticketed format. Nice. Um, and the last two years it sold out, uh, and I expect nothing less this year. <laughs> uh, but we have a couple thousand people. Last year was about 4,000 people um, and 20 goats. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the goats actually race. Yeah. And Isn't there one goat that wins every year? Uh, Princess Jenny. She, <laughs> it was, she almost lost this year. Um, this was her fourth win. Someone's got to take Fourth it win. <laughs> fourth win so in a row. So she's traveling around too? Or <laughs> they traveling around too, or is, is Sly no, Fox? There's, okay. Sly Fox is one of the only places that do go races, <laughs> so um, you can only see it there. The go racing circuit. Um, <laughs> there's no, there's not a circuit. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Not at yet. Least. Uh, but there's a big jumbotron, so you can you can watch from anywhere. Um, last year, where there was an instant replay because there was a tie, <laughs> like like legit tie, like they crossed at the same time, feet, head, <laughs> horns, all of it. Um, it's just really fun. Uh, so again, that's a unique event that's also been around for about 20 plus yeah. years. Um, it started at their original Phoenixville location and then has moved out to Pottstown, nice. um, which is wonderful because they purchased land next to them and it's perfect for events. Um, it was great when you walked the beer fest. <laughs> oh God, it's so good. Uh, and then I work with Punch Buggy to do Made on American Street. Um, this was originally a, a homebrew con contest. Uh, really? And barbecue. I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, before pandemic, the uh, Philadelphia Homebrew Club would host it because they were located on American Street, um, not where Punch Buggy is, but the building next to them. Which we just talked about before. Yep. <laughs> now Wish the Hicken is moving into the yeah. Thirteen. Yes. Yep. Um, officially official. Yeah. Uh, we had a call actually today uh, going through that they would be part of Made on American, which is nice. going to be great. Nice. Um, because it was really originally original thirteen and punch buggy. Mm -hmm. Last year was just punch buggy because nice like, original feed. Kind of the brewery cider family, mm -hmm. kind of keep it rolling. Yeah, and it's it's a fun event because it takes over American Street, so two blocks. I mean, live was, music. This past year, it was yeah. The trench were down for it, and there were still tons yeah. and tons of people out. People don't care. It was still a party. <laughs> it was so much fun, um, and it's a unique blend of a street festival and a beer fest. Yeah. So you can just go and shop local art vendors, or you can. Uh, a participate and sample a bunch of beers yeah. and wine and cocktails. We have uh, other vendors as nice. well. Yeah. That whole Again. street is kind of set up perfect because it's yep. like, it's a very nice street. Oh, it's so nice. The but renovation it, on, on American Street. You don't have to worry about traffic there. It's, mm -hmm. it's great. It's so nice to work with. And there's a ton of businesses on American Street now. And uh, this is the first year that the big, huge apartment buildings will be open. Yeah. So tons people. of people. Yeah. yeah. Just walking right down to the party. Yeah. Um, it was uh, the first year was so hot. Uh, <laughs> May is such a hard time for events because um, you don't know what you're gonna get. Yeah. So we got very hot the first year. It was raining this past year, and then 
Who we'll knows see. for this year? Yeah. Um, but people don't care because it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, that this is what you're doing full time, right? This is this is my full time gig. Um, I love it so much. And is, is there a difference between the homebrew? Because on LinkedIn it has like you know your consultant and homebrew events. Or you do stuff on the side that's like not technically under the homebrew events. So. Brand? I get hired to work with breweries, so technically it's not my own event, yeah. but I run it through homebrew events. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a lot of them I can co-brand it yeah. as homebrew events, um, but then I also do my own events as well. Okay. Um, you know, in 2018, I did an ice bar at Lemon Hill Mansion. Nice. Uh, it was That's one cool. of my favorite events I've ever done. And you do Cider Fest also, right? Yep. So I, most of my events are fundraisers of some sort. We'll backtrack and talk about yeah. that in a second because that's really important to me. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm very lucky that I got connected with the Fairmount Park Conservancy uh, to do events with their historic mansions. Nice. Oh, wow. um, so uh, just getting drunk yeah. in front of a nice old. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, there's a lot of history. Um, so before pandemic, um, Cider Fest was at six different houses around the park, and there was a bus that ran between all of cool. them. There was two, two to three cideries at each house, live music at each house, um, vendors at each house, and tours. Uh, after pandemic, it moves to just Woodford Mansion, um, just because of the, everything. Yeah. Um, but now it's just a fundraiser for them. Uh, it always happens in September and October. Uh, we now have aligned up with Philly Cider Week, uh, so it's the second to last weekend of October. <laughs> Download the Let's Rally app to find fun, random things to do in and around Philly. Let's Rally plans your day or night for you. Just tell the app how many people you have in your party and how far you're willing to go. You can also add filters like bars, experiences, and food, and the app will create a plan for you instantly. Unthink the day and download Let's Rally. I don't think of, yeah, I mean, I think about beer all the time. I don't think about cider. Much, yeah. but I don't think <laughs> about cider as having season. I guess that makes sense because apples are then picked then. It's... I feel bad for the cideries. <laughs> so, no, it's uh, cider making is more similar to wine making. Okay. Um, so it doesn't go through the boiling process. Um, fermentation takes longer because it's different yeast strains. But is it the apples that are picked that year come out that year? Or is it the year Depends after? on the cider. Okay. Um, some ciders ferment very quick and they can sell pretty quick. Okay. And then others are aged uh, for a year plus. Nice. Um, and there's a lot of really good cideries in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Where actually the apple growing capital of the east coast um we getting... just had nick from stones on and he yeah. said i mean he like he just sells beer at a distributor so like he kind of knows what's happening like what's selling like he doesn't have any skin in the game yeah and he was telling us that cider is like super hot right now i was just about to say the same thing yeah i mean it's so i feel like cider is slightly behind where beer is obviously um and it's taken a long time to really build that publicity and like excitement about it but it's definitely there I think it's more natural um, yeah. than seltzer and teas, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but And it doesn't have gluten in it. So there's a lot of people exactly. that can kind of, you know, they feel like they're drinking a more natural or yep. more crafty drink, I more guess. Crafty. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like still, you know, it doesn't have the gluten in it, which is like a huge thing for a lot of people. It's, it's so important. And, you know, I know John, who was on your last podcast, is like, yeah, seltzers and, and cocktails are cutting into – Beer sales, yeah, hundred percent. Um, I love cider. You know, and cider is now still growing, yeah, um, which is awesome. So, and there's lots of room for for growth in that industry. Um, you know, like wine, you can have dry, you can have semi dry, you can have sweet um, versions of cider. So, and it's all naturally done. Um, there are some ciders that add sugar back in, but for the most part especially locally most of them are natural. most of them very natural cool. um and most of them are dry on the drier side that's good I love yeah dry so uh one of the ciders that i brought is plowman um <laughs> get this yeah <laughs> um so plowman's from baylorville area and it's a fifth generation farmer uh ben who wanted to keep the family business going and growing and he basically ferments any fruits and some vegetables uh, that he can't sell at the farmer's market. So it's nice. he does a lot of wild fermentation, which is really freaking cool. Yeah, um, cider with 
Nicaraguan hibiscus. Yeah, so that one's hibiscus, but they do peaches in the summer. Um, it's all seasonal, yeah. which is really nice. Um, and he does different varieties, single varieties and blends. Um, and he does different yeast strains as well. Nice. Yeah. So I'm actually very excited to semi-announce, uh, but PA Cider Fest is coming back, and I'm going to be helping Ben from Plowman restart it. Um, and it's going to be in uh, Gettysburg area. Nice. In That's June. Really cool. This so, tastes like a Brett Saison. Right? It's like the natural yeast comes yep. out, and it tastes exactly like a Brett Saison. Yep. There's so much crossover, and it, it reminds me a lot of sours in the best way possible. Um, and just really, really well done and really thoughtful. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to bring a variety of stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I wanted to talk about that I found really cool. You did a Dungeons and Drafts event yeah. you put on. And I love their stuff on Instagram and yep. like what they're doing all over the community. They're really cool. So They're really taken off. And yeah. um, so they reached out to me uh, because we had a mutual friend. Uh, they're like, heard you do beer festivals. Like, yep, <laughs> I want to know more about what you do because that's really cool. Um, and we did an event at Bach Building uh, in October, and it was, you know, D&D themed beers uh, and then D&D themed vendors as well. Yeah. Um, it was so much fun, and we are hoping to do it again this year um, at an indoor outdoor location. And they're potentially going to be doing it maybe in Pittsburgh and New York, which wow. are some of their other locations as well. So I don't have any full details on that, but it was so much fun. <laughs> and it was really well attended. <laughs> nice. Love the Bach building. Yeah. yeah. Such a crazy space. I didn't know so many people played Dungeons and Dragons. Like, I, 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 I never I feel like played... it's having a, a resurgence, and I think Stranger it's... Things is definitely kind of <laughs> definitely. Um, But I like, I think it's a really cool format because a lot of times, like, D&D takes so long. Mm -hmm. And this is literally, like, you show up and you play for a couple hours and then you're done. Yeah. You know, like, it's not, like, a weekly commitment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm and sure the whatever, I don't know, Dungeons and Dragons, but, like, whatever yeah. the adventure, like, keeps getting crazier and crazier. It yep. keeps getting drunker and drunker. And it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a great partnership because it's bringing people into breweries. Uh, they also work with some distilleries as well. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's just a it's a smart partnership you know and that's kind of what i like to do as well i do some beer classes so it's like hey i'll bring people in yep. and like i'm helping you out you're helping me out you have a great location for this awesome yep. let's work together so you just mentioned distilleries you said you worked yeah. at distilleries earlier um we talked a little about beer obviously and cider what, yeah what have you done with distilleries um so i a lot of my events, I work with them to be included in the events okay. as well, yeah. um, just because there is a lot of people that would like cocktails yeah, or right. like, yeah, so why not help all the local guys yep. uh, and gals uh, to be able to showcase their stuff? Mm -hmm. um, it's just nice having a variety. Um, so they're part of, they're not part of Log Jammin' because it's loggers, but yeah. part of Made on American Street. Uh, part of Cider Fest, yeah. Um, part of Second Street Festival, all you know, all these events. Nice. Yeah. So cool. always really important to me to support the local, local companies, local breweries, distilleries, wineries, cideries, first. I mean, everyone's <laughs> kind of you know beer brews are competing against each other, but they're not really not. It's like the same things like yeah. cideries and distilleries. Like everyone's competing against each other, but not really. We're just trying to. Bring, it's a really wonderful community. Yeah. Um, you know, I think <clears throat> that's why I've stayed in the beer industry so long. It's easy to stay um, in You know, it's it's a good group of people. Um, people stick up for themselves and stick up for people that should be, st yeah. you know. Um, you know the, <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, don't, we don't put up a shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's really nice to be able to, to help each other out. Um, you yeah, know, we're in this together. Everybody's going through the same issues. Uh, why not be nice to each other and, and help out? Definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, you just mentioned that. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, I know you did Pink Boots. I don't know what you want to talk about first. Yeah. Um, so I've been part of Pink Boots basically since it began. Yeah. Um, and we have a Philly chapter, which is really awesome. Can you explain what Pink Boots is yeah. to people? Um, so Pink Boots uh, helps advance women and non-binary individuals in the brewing world 
Um, not just beer anymore. It's open to all fermented beverages. So kombucha, wine, cider, distilled spirits, um, coffee. Coffee is technically fermented. Yeah. Um, and through scholarships, through education, and through community and networking. Um, so I'm the co-chapter leader for Philly. Uh, this is my second year um, as a co-chapter leader. We do monthly meetups. I feel like yeah. I'm not in Pink Boots. But yeah. I think that like from the outside, I follow you guys on Instagram, and I know a lot of people that are in it. I feel like you guys have a very strong chapter. Like There's a lot of events that you do that have high attendance, yep. and you guys are like very hands-on on a lot of these things. Yeah, we do. You know, it's been really nice now that it's open to anything fermented. Yeah. Um, so we did last month, we did um, say, uh, Sacred Path, uh, which is an herbal shop. Okay. Talking about tea, botanicals, uh, botanicals and brewing, botanicals and distilling. Um, we've done winery visits. We do a hop yard visit in Reading um, at Fawn Hill Hop Yard, which is female owned. Um, Did you put on? I know the Pink Boots has put on like a, a, a education thing over at U Sciences a couple years ago. Were you a part of we, that? We we helped organize, okay. um, and it was a fundraiser for Pink Boots um, as well. Yeah, that was that was one of the best beer education things I've been to. A lot of times you go to these places and like, you know, two or three of the things are, you know, exciting to listen right. to, and then they'll have like some dude from Miller Coors, you know, talking about like reverse <laughs> osmosis, yada yada yada, and then somebody will talk about like how his grain fields are going. Like, obviously, I care about how the farms are doing, but like, I don't understand any of it. But this was like. I connected with everything that, like, all the class, yeah. the speakers that were there. Carol Stout got up and talked about, like, yep. her whole story was very cool. Yeah, she was the first female brewery owner and brewer, head brewer in Pennsylvania since Prohibition. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so, you know, talking about Pink Boots and really focusing on diversity and inclusion in the industry. And it, it's, it's such yeah. an important issue because, like, it is, you know, as much as you don't want to admit it, like, it is a male-dominated industry. There yep. is a, like, I don't know the exact numbers, but it is mostly straight white men with beers. I have beer now. Um, that are <laughs> brewing beer. And it's like, it, it's, it, you know, it causes issues. And there's like, there's a lot of issues with, you know, sexism and racism and all these other things. And, you know, it kind of came to a head in what was, it was 2020, It right? was May 2021. Yeah. Um, so May 2021, uh, Brianne, who was a uh, lead brewer, head brewer at Notch, um, put out a, a social media post about you know, sexism in the industry and something that she was facing and basically said, has anybody else experienced and it? And it went wild. It I saw it. I, yep. like, I don't know who this, I didn't know who uh, Brianne was, but like yep. within six hours, I was following her and I went and told my manager, I was like, yep. I don't know, like, I, don't, I hope Victory's not on it. We weren't mentioned, but no. I was like, well, you need to be aware of this. This is insane. She has... Gained 60,000 followers in 24 hours, and everybody is talking about this. It's so she used her power yeah. for good. Um, she focused on different cities. She focused on national, yeah. international, and focused on sharing stories and that people submitted. And there was all these, that, like, all these issues that just like weren't being highlighted, and then just like everything came to the front. And because everyone was looking at it, like it made everybody kind of realize all these things. Well, and that's that's the thing about it is that everybody that i know that's a woman or non-binary individual in the brewing world yeah. or distilling industry in general has had a negative experience whether it's like real real bad or like real you know all of it's bad yeah um so it's just like when you start hearing these stories back to back to back to back from breweries that you love or used to love yeah and you're like oh shit, i gotta pay attention to this so while you have always wanted to share one story, you hear thousands of stories, then change happens. Um, yeah, you know, one story is like you could, <laughs> you could, you know, make the argument, oh, it only happens here. But it was all across the country. It was, it was all over. And it was breweries that of every people size, love. Every, yep. every type of brewery. It was like everybody kind of had the same types of stories. Exactly. And people weren't able to ignore it anymore. Um there were a lot of people that lost their jobs, a lot of people that, um, a lot of breweries that put into place changes and created a new department for diversity and inclusion, um, you know, focusing on staff interaction, training, you know, promoting people yeah. from within. Mm -hmm. 
you know, refocusing on management, having female non-binary individuals in management positions, um, you know, getting rid of people that were causing trouble and doing bad things within the industry. I mean, I think them it, out. it hurt. I mean, not that it hurt, but like mm -hmm. it, it cleared out a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, the whole idea of craft breweries, like why people like it, is because there's people recognize that there's small breweries that start up, and like, yeah, it was male dominated. It was all these small breweries that started up, and like a lot of people when they start small breweries or small small businesses, a lot of times the last things you do is start up your human resources. Yep. And it's like it just kind of got pushed to the wayside and just kept getting crammed down. We have all these yeah. other issues. I'm not selling beer. I'm not going twenty percent every year. Human resources kept getting jammed down. And yeah. And just kind of put it in front, and it's like everyone like you need to deal with this right now. Yeah. Like all the organizations like Pink Boots. Yep. And Pink Boots was very supportive of Brian and stepped up, and they're like gave uh like kind of like instructions on like you need to deal with this, and they like, kind of walked everybody through like you need to stop what you're doing and like redo kind of everything. Yeah. That you, like how you're treating everybody, and, like how you're managing your employees. Yep, exactly. And it's something that's still being talked about. Of course. Um, I, if I can look at my phone real yeah, quick. Let's go. Um, I just need to look up and see what Brianne's organization is. Like she, started, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she started an, a nonprofit to help people learn yeah. and develop. And this, these shirts and um, sweatshirts and hats. Yeah, you see all goes to fund that's it. That's what he was talking yeah. about with the uh, Beer People podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Warren, he wears that. It's brave noise, brave, brave noise. Yeah, yeah brave, brave noise. noise. Yeah. Um, and now with the brave noise was like one of those like uh, it was one of those beers, right? Like the quiet, the uh, they do like you know national uh, collaborations where they like essentially send out a recipe and just like, yep. put it under this label, and then the proceeds of that will then support this cause. That's kind of where it started. Yeah. Um, before it became a nonprofit, and then they started it was funding the money that. From that, and then mm -hmm. it became turned into this. Yep. So, um, you know, focusing on legislation to change policies to help breweries change and, ad and yeah. adapt um, to keep the stories going yeah. um, so that it wasn't just Brianna as an individual, now it's an organization, um, and to really keep talking about it. Because, I mean, that's the problem. We didn't, we didn't talk about it on a, a national level before. For sure. And as much as what, whatever she was doing, like, there was no way that she could sustain that by herself. Like, she just turned into, like, the target because people were getting called out. And then, like, yep. you know, she couldn't manage that. So, like, stuff was going out that, like, she was just saying, like, you need an she organization just to, like, reposting. go through and actually mm -hmm. manage it. And it was, like, it essentially, like, her 24 hours of that happened then turned into this brave noise. It was, it, was cool. it was a couple weeks of her sharing. It was a couple weeks, but yeah. it, I mean, I say 24 hours, like it, it became something within 24 yeah. hours. It took no time oh, yeah. for it to was, jump up. It took off very fast. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, as I said, basically everybody that I know that are females in the, or non-binary non folks in the industry have experienced sexism, racism. Yeah. It, it, you know, like shit. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've gone through a lot of shit. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be as simple as like, you're at a beer fest and you're standing next to a male coworker that works in the tasting room and you're the brewer and they ask them, you know, like it's, it's passive like things sometimes, but then it's bigger issues of how breweries are run, toxic environments, um, not having women in positions of power or management or leadership. Um, you know, we, we are very lucky that Pennsylvania and Philly specifically have a lot of female owned breweries and cideries. Um, I brought a beer from Attic Starting um, with Carol Stout, I think she was the yeah, first female. She was the first one. The she set the she set the path. Yeah. Um, you know, Attic Brewing is in Germantown. Um, Laura is fantastic. And it's just really nice. I always try to support as many women owned breweries as possible. Um also with Pink Boots, we do a brew day every year um to raise money for Pink Boots. Um breweries can do it. Um and then you guys get a Pink Boots, Boots blend from Yakima Chief, I think, Yes. Right? Um, so that's a fundraiser. So any hops that are purchased through them uh, go to Pink Boots. And then also a percentage of the proceeds from the beers brewed from that also go to Pink Boots. Cool. Um, yeah, Pennsylvania, we've had anywhere from 10 to 30 breweries participate, which is really cool. Nice. Um, as a chapter, we also do a big brew day um, where we invite the entire chapter to come. And this year it's going to be at Chatty Monks now Pagoda City, right? Yeah, Pagoda City, City. Um, and that's going to be on March eighth, which is 
International Women's Day. Nice. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Are um, you organizing that? I'm helping to, okay. yeah. Um, as the co-chapter leader, we are in charge of making it happen. Um, John uh, Semler is going to be leading the brew, but um, it's it's a fantastic day. Last I year... John Semler. Yeah. Where is he? Where? I, he was where with Free Will. Him. Okay. Um, right. And then he went to consulting, and now he's been with them pretty much from the time he left gotcha. Free Will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've done... This will probably be the eight... Uh, collaboration brew day that we've done nice. in the city. Um, I was able to host two at St. Ben's while I was there. Um, but Yards hosted. Um, Love City has hosted. Triple Bottom. Um, Workhorse Brewing. I see you do events at Triple Bottom. Is that like one of your go-to spots? I love Triple Bottom <laughs> so much. Um, I've done classes with them and then they've been pretty much part of all the other events that I've yeah. done as well. What's the owner of that? Uh, Tess. Tess. Yeah, she's fantastic. It's very smart. Um, it's really kind of like cool, Cow Hill area, because yeah, you have Love City with right Melissa, yep. and then um, Triple Bottom right across the street. What's the concert <laughs> venue right there? Uh, Union Transfer. Union Transfer. Um, and then Poison Heart just Poison opened. Heart, yes, the cocktail um, Fantastic, and also yeah. female-owned. Nice. <laughs> Got yeah, it. I've not been there, but I, I've been meaning to go there for a bit. And then there's fantastic. what, uh, La Chinesca is right down the street. There's a lot mm -hmm. of places right there. That whole area is changing and developing, just like Kensington mm -hmm. area. Yeah. Um, you know, there's still large concentration of breweries and distilleries up this way. Um, you know, when I was at St. Benjamin's, we had a bat by the door. <laughs> you know, like, it's just, it's changed so much. And now there's a rock gym that blocked out. Exactly. You know, like, I mean, it's, it's John, nice. <laughs> Philadelphia Burn bought their building in 2000 in Kensington. Holy shit. <laughs> I, yeah. Billy used to tell me, like, they used to, like, bring everybody's cars in and then like bring the gates down <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah it's just a lot different now um yeah the whole area has changed and i i think it's important to note that you know saint ben's went into a neighborhood that was not developed yet you know it was on the verge of developing mm. but it wasn't um you know punch buggy and original 13 also that was before american street was renovated um you know these businesses are investing in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. and food and beverage establishments are doing that and they're changing the neighborhoods i think in yeah, a positive go, they way go first and they kind of like help yeah. kind of establish themselves and you bring people else can kind of grow off of that yeah you bring yep. people in and and you start changing the area in a very positive way and people want to come to that area um you know for uh when we were working with sunflower they would do like trash pickup days you know like pick up trash in the neighborhood. Um, you know, for this year for Oktoberfest, we spent 20 hours cleaning up Germantown Ave, you know, just to run the event because we wanted to make that area nice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to do that again this year, you know, keep that area as nice as possible. Mm -hmm. Same with American Street. We go up and down and we clean the street. Um, Second you. Street Festival. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, the, well, you know, like... You want to leave the space nicer than when you got there. Yeah. That was something I learned from Girl Scouts. <laughs> um, you know, like it's, it does apply to events as well. You know, there's a lot of positive things that are done with events. So cleaning up the area, bringing business to the neighborhood. That was the whole point of Second Street Festival. Can bring, we, what yeah. you're talking about now cleaning up, can you walk us through your day during like, Second, something's one of these big events. Like, are you up at like 4 a.m. and it's just like total mayhem until 10 p.m. at night? Um, Second Street is its own special thing. Um, that one, I'm basically up for 24 hours yeah. and working. Uh, most events, I get there between 5 and 7 a.m., make sure all the cars are towed, do the first initial walkthrough. How often are cars all the, still there? Every time? Oh, yeah. People don't, <laughs> people don't move their cars. Um, so we, we hire a towing company. Yeah. They move the cars into the neighborhood, not impounded. Yeah. Um, Cole just had his, tar uh, his car towed. It's <laughs> somewhere week. in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, he found it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we keep track of where they go. <laughs> um, all the rental companies come in to do the tents and tables, chairs. Um, staff arrives. We start setting up all the vendors. Food trucks arrive, and then the health department has to come and do all of the inspections. And then the bands start arriving, and then the people. 
So and it's like what, when all the <laughs> vendors come, it's just like you have 10,000 people trying to ask you the same questions over and over and over again. That's why I hire a lot of day of staff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very lucky that I have a good group of people. You got Rolodex now. Yeah. So they're, you know, they've been with me for years. They know events. And I'm lucky that all the, you know, events that I do, I'm able to build in a budget for day of people because I can't be everywhere and do everything. I need to be the overview, big picture person. And this then I have- This is why we need you. This yeah. is the same way that Evan <laughs> talks about like brewed at. It's like, you think like, you know, you own a brewery, I'll just throw a, a beer fest. There's all these other things that need to happen. Like you're hiring other people just day of, like people don't understand that. That's a really big piece of it and managing them. Yeah. You know, you mm -hmm. have 20, you know, for Oktoberfest, we have six bartenders each side. We have four at registration. We have one at the Shotsky, maybe two. We have three or four floaters. So that's like 20 to 30 people that you have to manage. Yeah. And then I also hire a volunteer coordinator, a staff manager. <laughs> so it's like me, them, staff. Um, and then and this then way. And 10,000 drunk people. So a lot of people and we, you know, you hire day of security just to make sure nothing weird happens and it's, it's a fun day. And then, you know, I'm excited that the brewery owners get to enjoy their event. That's the whole point. You know, like they help with setup mm -hmm. and they help with dealing with any issues, but they get to go enjoy their event. Yeah. Rather than <laughs> worrying about it yeah. the entire time. Exactly. Yeah. You don't like. Especially like if you're yeah. putting that on, like. Your job is you go around, you're kissing babies and shaking hands all day. Yeah. Like you need to go around. That's your party. They are that's, throwing the party. They have they are the two hostess. days a year. That they Post have thousands <laughs> of people there, and they like they are going around. And they're making yep. sure every they talk to everybody, they see everybody, mm -hmm. and like if you have to manage the party at that point, like you know everyone's like they're they're bothered because you're not giving them the time of day, but you're just trying to make yeah. sure everything happens. But that's why you're there. Make exactly. Sure. So I keep making sure everything's running smoothly. Perfect. And I get to enjoy the event too, but like exactly. I'm on call basically yeah. dealing with anything that comes up, um, which there always are. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I like, I like solving problems. Like that's part of my skill set. Yeah. We ran out of wristbands. Okay. We'll figure this out. We, we ran out of beer. The very first Oktoberfest that we did, we ran out of beer like three hours into the event. We were pulling kegs and stuff off of tanks <laughs> to fill. But it was we just had more people come than we expected. Yeah. So we, but we made it work. Like I'm just trying always, to picture like Andrew like with like a stein in one hand, just trying to like fill kegs. He the other. just he did great. <laughs> the whole team was great. But it's it's just dealing with any issues that come up. You yeah. know, like it's it's fun. It's it's uh, you get to use your brain and like really figure things out. Um, and you get to work with really cool people. Yeah. It's cool. You know, yeah. coming from, you know, like starting off, it is very cool. You start off, you know, booking um, concerts and it's like a concert and a beer fest. Not that it's the same thing, but it's like they're very similar. And then you slowly move into uh, beer and then like kind of event coordination, kind of like everything. You know, everything as much as works it seems together. Like, very random, but like it comes in and it's like, <laughs> oh, it makes sense that you're now running all the, these events in Philadelphia. You yeah. have more experience than anybody else doing these things. It's a unique skill set that, like, you know, I've been doing events since 2004. It's a unique skill set that also, you know, like, as much as, like, it's important, like, Human Robot throws two huge parties. Or, like, yeah. each second street happens, but it happens once a year. Yeah. So, you to become an expert at that, but it only happens once a year. Not that it's a waste of time, but like you're there that like, then they don't have to do that. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's just something that instead of like this huge ordeal, like it's, you, they don't have to worry about it. They can just kind of find you and then you kind of set everything in. Yeah. Motion. And yeah, depending on the size of the event, how early you start planning. Um, so, you know, for all of my spring events, which start in April um, and go through the end of June, events every weekend basically um i'm planning now you know like we started did the initial emails in december and then we're like in full planning mode now yeah for those events that are happening months from now yeah it just takes a lot of time to get all the pieces together um you know i do I want to run through all the events that i do <laughs> um yeah, I think, and then talk about nonprofits too, because there's a tie 
uh, most of them are fundraisers for for nonprofits. So um, you still do those as well? So I mean, most of it's built into those. Okay. So um, Log Jammin is a fundraiser for the Michael Jackson Foundation yep. for Brewing Distilling. Yep. Uh, that diversity in the industry. 100%. Yeah. Uh, last year we added Michael a, Jackson, by the way. Not that was, Michael Jackson. <laughs> the Michael Jackson that wrote the best beer books, not the King of Pop. <laughs> yes. The the King of Beer. <laughs> yes. Um, so last year we had Breeze uh, run Luminary Voices, which is a panel um, having women or non-binary folks uh, doing a panel discussion. That was at... Uh, that was at Log Jam in last year. I've seen that. Yep. Um, and Log Jam moved from a parking lot to Cherry Street Pier. So it's grown in size. Now it's a thousand people. Um, it's going to be June first this year. Cool. But that's a huge fundraiser. We've raised five thousand dollars the last two years. We're trying to double or triple our fundraising for this year. Nice. So we haven't set our goal officially yet. But um, you know, with Breeze joining uh, Michael Jackson Foundation as operations manager, we're going to have a great uh, connection. Nice. So. Uh, and then Woodford Mansion, the Cider Fest goes to the mansion. Um, yeah, there's and there's just a lot of good organizations. Um, the SPCA is uh, fundraised through Sly Fox, the goat cool. races. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Goats helping cats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and last year, last two years, we've had uh, dog adoptions at Sly Fox goat races, and all the dogs get adopted. That's awesome. Perfect. <laughs> so That's awesome. always nice. Um, so because I started in the nonprofit world, having a fundraising um, component to events are, is very important to me. Definitely. And like we talk about it sometimes, it's like as the brewing industry, it's like you you need that. It's, it's built into it. It's just like if, you, if you're not helping the community, if you're not like don't have some other mm -hmm. thing that you're helping besides just like running a business, it's like, you know. Yeah, people it's, don't it's like a, it. It's, it's local they business. They like the fact that you're involved in everything. Like part of why people like it is because you care about it, and like the fact that like you know you put it on that like this. It's it's part of the, it's part of the craft brewing experience. Yep, and it's it's so important. And you know, right now we're fighting for a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, you know, in twenty 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 two, Petra, who works at Four Humors yeah. Distilling, um, she's fantastic. Her and I did We Descent which was a fundraiser for the National Abortion Fund. Um, we didn't do it last year, but we're going to bring it back this Where year. Where was that at? Um, it was at Love City. Okay. Cool. So in the parking lot of Love City. Uh, they have a great parking lot for They events. do. <laughs> Although uh, they're not really doing events there anymore, unfortunately. But they're doing events in the brewery, well, so that's fine. their brewery is awesome also. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but we raised like $8,000 for the National Abortion Fund um, through raffles, through vendor fees. It was nice. great. Um, we're hoping to work with uh, Philadelphia Brewing Company and Martha this year. Cool. That yeah. whole street, we, I mean, we just talked to them. That whole street is yep. exciting. <laughs> I'm excited about, do you know when the opening is for that? I don't even know what it is. I heard it's natural <laughs> wine and like sardine. Or, I don't, like I keep saying this stuff, but I keep saying different things each time. But I just know it's <laughs> going to be good. Everything that those people do is Yeah, good, that's so. very true. <laughs> um, but yeah, fundraising is so important. Um, because I came from a fundraising background. Yeah. Um, and then I do a couple of my own events. I did a punk rock prom um, this past October. I'm going nice. to do it again. So kind of back to my roots, booking punk bands. Uh, and everybody got dressed up in prom attire. Yeah. I was at the First Unitarian Church, nice. um, which is a BYO venue. Uh, we had a lot of fun, spiking the punch. <laughs> Not spiking Getting the punch. Good church. Um, and then we raised money for Planned Parenthood. Nice. Um, and had a photo booth and the whole thing. Cool. So. <laughs> Lots of fun. Nice. Um, I think that is time, though. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you have anything you want to promote? Any events or anything? I mean, you, you are the event person, but do you have anything <laughs> that you want to especially call out? Um, all right, let's see. First couple of events. Um, so starting the, the yoga at Manitani Stillworks. Let's go. Sundays, 1245. Well, we're be there. Little mindfulness, a little drink. A lot of fun. <laughs> um, and then the first big event of the year is This Is Not Croydon Fest, which is the Scott Festival at Broken Goblet. Um, I've known Jeremy from Broken Goblet. Great, Jumpstart great Records. tap room. Yep. Um, known him for about 20 Where years. Where is that stage from? <laughs> um, it is Bowie's touring stage. Whoa. So it's a legit music venue, beautiful space. Um, and this year it's going to be three days. So it's Friday is free, and then Saturday, Sunday is ticketed. So this will be the third year that I'm involved with that. 
probably move logistics, vendors, and staffing. Nice. Um, after that will be Sly Fox Goat Races, May 5th. Uh, Made on American Street will be May 18th. And that will be on American Street with Punch Buggy and Wissahickon. After that will be Log Jammin' Lager Fest at Cherry Street Pier with Human Robot. And then PA Cider Fest, we don't have a date officially yet, but it should be Father's Day weekend in Gettysburg area with uh, Parman. Nice. And then actually Pink Boots Conference is coming to Philadelphia um, end of June. Nice. Nice. So like the National Conference? National Conference. Very cool. Um, Let me look at dates real quick. Because uh, that's going to be huge, having women from all over, yeah. women and non-binary. For that yet? Yeah, so it's going to be very cool. Um, hosted at Rivers Casino, uh, the 23rd through the 26th nice. of June. Wow. Um, but it's going to bring a national spotlight to the city of Philadelphia. Yeah. Tons of educational events, speakers, presenters, and field trips. So that's going to be my April and June. <laughs> April, May, and June. <laughs> Dude, yeah, I just time management again. <laughs> <laughs> Doing good. Yeah, you, you are the busiest person in this room. Um, <laughs> three busy people, you're the busiest. Um, so I guess where can we find Homebrew Events? At Homebrew Events on Instagram. Yep. And then homebrewdevents.com. Yep. Cool. Easy peasy. Nice. Cool. Um, you can find us at, at, Brood, at Broodat or at Broodat Podcast. And uh, we'll see you